huge. All right, since the last time we talked, there was a big win in New Hampshire. Were you expecting that kind of margin? No, I didn't expect that kind of margin. Uh, my sense was that uh, Sanders would undoubtedly win New Hampshire. But uh, I was up there for most of this last week, and I saw the Clinton campaign, which was, uh, I thought, doing a really full-on job. Uh, went to a couple of Hillary Clinton events where I thought her speeches were stronger than in the past. Uh, and I saw her ground operations, and they looked serious. She had the endorsement of the governor. She had the endorsement of the Democratic U.S. senator. Um, so my sense was that it was probably going to close to in the range of 10 to 12. Uh, what was fascinating was it didn't close. And, I, you know, I think an element of that has to do with Sanders' appeal. I, I, no doubt of that. But I also think that the Clinton campaign is still really struggling to figure out how to respond to this. And I think that some of the responses that they mustered up in New Hampshire were perhaps more damaging to Hillary Clinton than beneficial. I think they were a little bit too over the top in some of their attacks on Sanders. And I'm just not sure that that really resonated with folks. Doesn't mean that the Clinton campaign won't figure out much more effective ways to to communicate and to, to challenge Sanders. But uh, I do think there were some stumbles there. And I think that's one of the reasons why that margin essentially remained uh, as wide as anybody could have imagined. And now the pundits are saying that the minority vote is going to be a firewall for mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton. Van Jones pointed out mm -hmm. that Bernie won among women in New Hampshire because of the young women. And he mm -hmm. said there's no reason to think that young Hispanics and young African Americans might turn out for Bernie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm always a little unsettled by the use of the word firewall because that presumes a particular community, a uh, particular group of people are just locked in and they, they aren't going to be listening to the campaign or aren't going to pay attention to things. And I don't believe that. I, I've covered uh, an awfully lot of elections uh, in urban areas and big cities uh, and also in the rural south where the electorate was a predominantly African-American electorate. And what I've seen is, and what I believe strongly, is that this is a sophisticated electorate. Uh, these are folks who vote on a variety of different concerns and that, uh, yes, they're going to vote for people that they feel are, you know, most in line with their views and most in line with their concerns. And yes, I think Hillary Clinton has a real advantage in the African-American community and uh, to a pretty good extent in the, in the Latino community. But what I would suggest to you is that um, there's, gonna, there's a lot of campaigning ahead of us, a lot of communication to be made. And what we've seen so far is that when the campaign heats up, uh, younger voters, uh, no matter what their background, seem to have a great deal of interest in Bernie Sanders. Also, one of the other divides that I've found really interesting as I've looked just in the first two states, so we have to be cautious about this, is that uh, among low-income voters, people who are making under 30000 a year, and these are folks who really are um, struggling in many situations. And Sanders does very, very well. His percentages go down as you move up into you know, over 200000 over 100000 you know, people who are doing a little better, uh, or maybe a lot better. And so I would not rule out that you will see uh, you know, a, a substantial movement among voters who are perhaps younger, some low-income folks, uh, some others, across the, uh, all, of our, all the demographics towards Sanders as you get into these other states. That will close the gap. Um, but he also has responsibilities as well. You know, he comes from an overwhelmingly white state. He comes from a circumstance in which his focus has been heavy duty on economic issues for a long time, which many people find tremendously appealing. But I mean, it is very vital for him to communicate effectively a deep concern about racial injustice, about immigration, about police violence, about mass incarceration, but also about the, the uh, particular harm that is done to the African-American community when we have an austerity economics. And uh, this is, the, the onus here is on Sanders. He, it is his job to get out there and, and communicate I think you've seen him doing it on the stump. He has incorporated a lot of uh, a much broader message 
into his into his speech. But that's gonna he's gonna have to continue to do that, and he's gonna have to drive it home and work very hard because it is about building a, a relationship with people, and that relationship isn't just built on what you say. It's also built on a real sense that you understand, that you get it, and that your sense of priorities is broad enough that you're gonna you're gonna bring in people who often have been historically neglected and left behind. Yeah, one thing that there's a buzz on on the internet is a lot of the networks are reporting the super delegates, yeah. and they're not showing a separate count of the sure. contested dele or the committed delegates. And is there a reason do you think? Well, that's a very important issue. And uh, same thing we had back in 2008. And the, uh, in that case, Barack Obama's supporters were uh, very concerned about an overemphasis on the, on the full delegate count uh, rather than looking at you know, what a candidate has actually won, the so-called pledge delegates. And, and I think it's important in this year as well. For a reason that's different than just the Sanders versus Clinton dust-up. Right. They, they're, you know, obviously Sanders people want to have a reporting of the pledge delegates because they've been doing pretty well uh, there. The Clinton people want the superdelegates reported because obviously that bumps their number up, even in places that they haven't won a majority or at least haven't won, you know, a big majority. And so, I mean, that's that's your politics and, and campaigns do that. What's more important, in my view, is a subtlety that I think people forget about. Superdelegates are free to switch their allegiance at any time, right up till they, they cast their vote. Uh, and it has happened a lot historically. And so for the networks to announce superdelegates at, at an early stage is to neglect a potential of movement and a potential of uh, rethinks on people's part. Uh, and I'm not necessarily talking about superdelegates going from Hillary Clinton to Bernie Sanders. I'm talking about potentially Depending on how this race goes, some superdelegates saying, you know, I'm not, I don't like either of these folks. I really now I'm, I'm looking to try and draw somebody else in, right, or as, as has been discussed. So I think that the networks, I think everybody would be very, very well served if they simply did a, a dual column. I mean, just say pledge delegates in these states, and then here's also where the superdelegates are. It's nothing wrong with reporting it, but make it clear to people what has been won so far and what is supportive, sympathetic, but not necessarily locked in. Okay, thank you. Not a problem. Okay. Good luck thank to you. you.